Hello, everyone. You have uh, David and Ajir here from WatcherPass.com, and today we are joined by our special guest, Mr. Neil Bledsoe. He is the star of the upcoming Western film, A Soldier's Revenge. He's a talented actor, and he's going to talk to us a little bit about the project and uh, maybe give us some insights into how the movie was made. So uh, welcome, Neil. Hey, what's going on? How are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you for thank you for joining us. Uh, I guess I'll start with our I guess standard question in this time. Uh, how, how are you doing? How personally? How are you doing in this uh, new world that we're in? Uh, well, you know, I have access to therapy and um, <laughs> and quaaludes, so <laughs> I guess I'm doing okay. But that's always kind of a relative question these days. Uh, you know, I'm doing all right. Thanks for asking. Um, you know, I, one of the things that I really appreciated about being in uh, in new york is it's really run the gamut on human experience you know from from kind of the uh the sadness and terror and fear and uncertainty of lockdown and through certainly all the death and the illness we've had here but then really the beauty of seeing everybody come out in the, in the public square in a really positive way in the last few weeks it's mm -hmm. uh it's been very heartwarming you think if there was one city that would persevere through adversity it would be new york so that's that's good to hear yeah, either that or like Cairo, but uh, you know, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure there are other cities around the world that, that are equally persevere, but American cities, yeah. Yeah, and you know, I guess one of the big concerns with all the uh, lockdowns and everything is is working. But you're you have a new movie coming out. It's out in digital. It's out on Blu-ray and DVD. Um, yeah, I, I do still have other things happening, so it's good to hear. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the movie and um, you know what, what it was like making it? Sure, sure. What do you want to know? Uh, I guess the first question is, I think this, you know, you, you'll know your history better than we will. This, this seems like maybe one of your first Western movies. So I guess how, how did you go about preparing for this role? Uh, well, I didn't have a lot of time, to be honest. I was, uh, I'd flown to New York and I was sitting with my agent uh, having lunch and I got a call from my, uh, my LA team and they said, uh, we've got an offer for you to do a film with Al Kilmer. And I was like, great. <laughs> uh, this is Friday, and this is Friday. They bear in mind. And I said, I was like, "When does it start shooting?" They said Monday. <laughs> oh, <laughs> like, okay. Uh, do you? When do you re, You know? When do you? Do I need to give them an answer by? Well, this afternoon. I was like, "Okay. Well, I got to go read the script." So I canceled everything I was doing. Walked in my uh, my agent's office and kicked my heels up and uh, told Sheila to hold all my calls and. <laughs> um, and read the script and um you know they of course wanted to know if i could ride a horse and all the rest of that stuff just for safety so of course i lied to them and told them that i could uh, just so yeah, i could be in a, like in a western with Doc Gummer. exactly <laughs> just like riding an overly large bicycle to <laughs> kick you and kill you yes exactly exactly like riding a bicycle well put <laughs> <laughs> that's nuts. I mean, that, that's exciting, but it must be that must have been stressful to figure out. I mean, how long was the shooting? You had to figure out if you could go for I, what, like a month or. Yeah, it was like it was like three, four weeks. Um, you know, I, I had been on a horse. In truth, I had been on a horse uh, once before that, and um, and I was like, I think I was at a I was at a Catholic youth camp. I am not Catholic, but I, I my mom I don't know for whatever reason sent me there and. I rode horses for like um, for for a couple weeks, and that was it. And that was when I was like eight years old. So, thirty years later, when this rolled around, they were like, uh, "Hey, can you ride horses?" Like, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I went to Catholic horse camp, guys. <laughs> 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 they didn't ask you how well. Yeah. They just said, can exactly, you? <laughs> exactly. I. I was in here with the body and blood of Christ. I know what I'm doing. And, um, but I, you know, I, I, truth be told, I, I picked it up pretty easy. And, uh, um, uh, I don't know, you, you know, you, you take to certain things really well. And maybe it was just my, my fear and arrogance, uh, my fear of dying and my arrogance and belief that I could do it. Uh, and I would spend literally every, every minute, um, just riding horses when I could. And that's the real joy of working on a film like this is you've got, it's kind of like a subculture. Like one, one week we had, um, we had a bunch of civil war reenactors and these guys don't just reenact the civil war. They like, they reenact world war two battles. They reenact desert storm battles. They reenact Vietnam battles. They're like, they just go around reenacting. In fact, those guys told me one of the best stories I, I ever heard about a reenactment. I think it was like this, 
was like a 250th, no, not 200th, it was like a 200th or like 250th, whatever it was. Uh, it was going to be a recreation of the Battle of Gettysburg, and all these guys came from all over. Now, the schism between the reenactors isn't north and south as it was in the Civil War, it's between east and west. So when these two camps got together, no one who could agree of like which generals they were going to be. So they had to like settle it and do it on two different days. So this battle, this reenactment of this pivotal battle had, in fact, a civil war inside of it. And I was like, that is fascinating. Um, so we would, there would be things like that that you could just ask guys, um, you know, what your gear was, what, uh, what this bedroll was. And those guys get incredibly specific. Or if it's the horse guys, they're... They're coming in from Wyoming and they're all like old ranchers and um, they they love being on horses and they, they love nothing more than to kind of teach you what you want to know. Um, and in fact, then on the other side with uh, some of the great actors like uh, Michael Bowen and Jay Pickett and um, uh, James Russo, um, those guys have so much institutional knowledge of being on a film set from being in films with you know, De Palma to to uh, Quentin Tarantino to even you know fucking Sergio Leone, like they have they have a an institutional knowledge of not just how a western is made, but like how a spaghetti western is made. So <laughs> it was it was incredible to be able to lean on those guys that have thirty forty years of being on a film set, and and then on the other side, it's just like you know one of the things I loved really about making films as well is that it kind of feels like being like you're cast away. what you're out to see with all these people. And you know, it, mm -hmm. the shit may sink, it may get where it's going, but like you really have to rely on everybody in this really hyper collaborative way to, to make something good. And so when you have, um, when you have guys like that from the trainers to the reenactors to the, the actors, it's, uh, and you can rely on them and trust them. It's a really special thing. I, I'm, I was so excited to hear your answer to that because the more and more I dived into the cast, the more and more it just became Charlotte's Web. Like so many people, so diverse with really extended careers and, you know, the young, even the young crew to the to the people that the veterans that's been around all this time. It's just like you guys have yeah. really been into so many different projects. I can't even imagine the type of sidebar conversations you guys had and distractions <laughs> of just going back to things. But I think it does really stem to one person and the icon and Michael Pfeiffer, just how was it to work with him? I'm, and, and then again, I started looking, I was like, I'm surprised you two have never worked together until now, or if I'm wrong, but it just seems like a match made oh, in no. heaven. Yo, no, 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 we, we really did work together. And I think, um, you know, the, the person that convinced Michael to offer me the role was, um, was his wife, Kaya. Uh, mm -hmm. And they, um, you know, I, I think they had, they had a certain amount of faith in my work. And uh, Michael's whole philosophy of how to direct and what to direct is through, um, uh, he comes from an architecture background. Do you guys know this? I no. did not know that. No, I didn't. Oh, uh, yeah. He's, he comes from an architecture background. So what he kept stressing during the shoot was that he wanted to kind of build the architecture in the frame. And what goes on in the frame as far as like, relationship or anything else were that was between uh that was between me and the rest of the cast and one of the first things he said to me uh when i and because i didn't have a lot of time to prepare you know like so i i um i had read the thing on a friday i was in new york and i had to fly back for my first day of shooting that monday so I didn't have a lot of time to like sit down and really like comb through the script. And one of the first things he said to me, which is very generous and always a good sign, is like, you know, if we, if you feel like there's something you won't say or that your character Frank wouldn't say, just don't say it. And I was like, okay, that's that's generous, but I, I still have to really rely on you um, because I uh, am getting some New York atmosphere in the background. The the ambulance, is, the death is among us again. Um, uh, I said, I'm really going to have to rely on you because I, I, I won't know this all that well. But we eventually figured out a, a good kind of way of working, I think, which is, uh, you know, we sit and kind of really distill down what each scene was. And that's, again, where it gets back to these great character actors, because once you have those guys into it that are like, you know, that each come from different acting schools, different 
different backgrounds of experience, mm-hmm. then you're just, you're really starting to like play jazz with these other great musicians. And as a, and as a, an actor who's like, you know, I've done some stuff, but I'm, but I'm only 15 years in these guys have more than twice the amount of time on sets. And I just like, I'm always amazed by how good people that have that much experience are. And Michael as well. So Michael would let us run and do, uh, do quite a lot. I maybe took, took that, uh, took that liberty too far sometimes, but it was always in, uh, in service of, uh, of a better story, I think. And you mentioned it again, but that just, I'm shocked again that you, you read the script on Friday and we're doing the, you know, at onset on Monday because it felt very natural for you. you. You know, you kind of fit the role perfectly. Um, Thank you, you very much. I, I, you know, I, 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 I kept wondering who they had fired or <laughs> which actor <laughs> they lost when I was on set. So it was like, was it John Stamos or was it who'd you lose? <laughs> uh, well, there's, there's no asterisk next to your name, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> uh, I know, I know. I appreciate that, guys. That's very uh, sweet of you to say. But I so felt like I was panicked and lying the whole time. But thank you. Did Did you find that your character kind of grew as you, you know? as you said, kind of getting an appreciation for him or you know, did you kind of go from the start and just kind of go with your gut? Uh, yeah, I, I look, I, I got, um, you know, I, 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 like I said, I think Mike is, is more, is more really focused on the architecture of the scene and, and we didn't have that much time to really dive in and get into the psychology. So I come from a theater background where I really want to like understand the entire arc and really have things nailed down and make decisions. But that's, you know, when you get thrown into a project like that, you can't always take that time and luxury with, um, with that kind of preparation. So you have to, you have to just dive right in. And uh, I had a really good friend of mine, um, you know, the actress, Abigail Spencer. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, I was talking to to Abigail about it, and she uh, she she said something that I was uh, that I thought was a really good piece of advice, which is when you don't have time to think about the whole, essentially you just have to make every scene as good as you can, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think that's kind of where I was just using as much instinct as possible. Um, but sure, I mean that that first day I was trying to like fucking make my voice sound like Clint Eastwood. I was squinting <laughs> way too much. I, mean, I was like, I was like, I was a cliche. I was no, I was a facsimile of a cliche. It was, uh, yeah, you know, I was. It was good. I, I I think that the more, you know, because part of it too is like once you get on a horse like that, and you're kind of you kind of make it look like you know what you're doing. If you've like lived on a horse and. All that kind of stuff. So there's a certain amount of just that you're. Pre- there's pretense to it. There's a certain amount of kind of fake in it. Um, but uh, but hell, guys, at the end of the day, made a western, and that's that's pretty hell. That's pretty cool. I I have never acted a day in my life, but if I was ever to get on a horse, I am absolutely going to look like I've been riding horses for the last twenty years of my life. Oh, sure, exactly, exactly. <laughs> and you got to do that Clint Eastwood voice. You got to do the Clint Eastwood <laughs> voice, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just like there, and that's and that's actually part of the danger of being in a western too, is because so many of the people, you know, so many of the actors we know and then and, and performances we love, they're so iconic, mm-hmm. you know. So it's like you 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 end up kind of in, unless you're careful, you end up kind of doing like uh, you know the diet coke version of, of yeah. whatever that is. I mean, it's like doing a mob film, right? Everybody just wants that's to sound true. like Joe Pesci or De Niro. Yep. And that's what you see those things like, no, we got a thing going on. You guys, no, hey, yo, mm-hmm. we guys, we're guys from the neighborhood, you know? And you're like, oh. <laughs> and I, I've actually done one of those too. And I was just like, this is, we're, we're not going to do it like this. But um, <laughs> yeah, man. That, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, like you said, when it comes down to specific type of genres, when you're doing a Western, there's a certain level of expectancy that you know that you're going to get. You know that at any moment, this can be just that legendary film that everyone's going to refer back to for years and years. Um, and I and I definitely think that, you know, that that's that has to be a chip that comes on everyone's shoulder into taking roles as this. I was going to definitely say that um, your your character, so Frank really had a lot of different dynamics throughout this film. And one that really, really, really stuck out to me, and I thought it was intense, 
I, th- I thought everything leading up to this moment was intense, but I thought there was just another added level of intensity um, and within your acting when it came down to the scenes where um, the kids were coming to look for your services. So Savannah and Luke Judy. Yeah. How, how was it to film a scene where you have to have almost pure anger and aggression towards probably two of the nicest kids that you've probably ever worked <laughs> with? Because they're awesome. They're awesome. I've seen them in so many projects. But like, how do you feel right. a scene when you have to build that type of aggression and anger uh, towards them? And it really did come off so authentic. It was, it was really, like I said, one of the most intense scenes of the film. Thank you. Um, well, the, the secret is that both Savannah and Luke are, and in fact, monsters. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a certain I don't want to call it method acting, but they're just jerks. So I <laughs> just use it. Just use it. Uh, and I was I showed up drunk that day too, so that made it easy. Um, you're just, you're, you're you, also method acting. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I, um, you know, I I think that part of part of the thing that's really nice working with kids is they're going to react. Uh, they're going to react to a lot. They don't act. A lot you know they don't they don't have um on some ways like the, the, the real danger zone is when you get people that are like just a few years into their career you know that are kind of like young people or that are really hyper aware of themselves or in my kind of age bracket that's kind of like the the, the irony is is the years that you kind of act the most you're probably quote unquote acting the most as well and you get to the later stages of your career you just don't you don't give a shit and then the early stage of your career you kind of you're too young to know any difference so you can react to stuff so those guys what i wanted to do is really it was really affect them um you know and so uh, and, and and look it's like one of the one of the other challenges you have in in 2020 or in it, it, that we have in this uh, day and age is we have to have conversations around um, something like that just because you have to measure comfort level. So I would always just check in with them and like say to the kids, hey, I got to kind of rough you up in this scene. Is that okay? You know, hey, I've got to yell at you in this scene. Is that, you know, and of course they're just little squirts and like not. He's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, throw me up against the wall. And you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, but it's like, it's, I, I, I hear what you, I hear the question beneath the question, which is, is how do you do that personally when you have to get that thing professionally? Yeah. So um, I think you just you have to treat them like colleagues and uh, try to really affect them and surprise them. Yeah, I, I was going to say just, you know, um, as a fan and viewing the movie, you know, seeing them in tears and uh, and how you're just overdoning on them is just like. I, I I I get both angles of the characters here, but it's just like, oh my god, they're so cute, and they're just in tears. Like, what am I going to do? I was like, we got to talk to this guy. He's a bully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But an amazing well, I, job, and I think and I think that's important. You. you bring up consent. Yep. Thank you. I I you know I also wanted to. Um, I think my instinct was to make the uh, the journey of redemption a little super, you know, and make it make it because I, I I think some. My feeling is, is when I when I see those kind of redemptive journeys and they're just plot driven, you know, they're just kind of like, oh, this happened, and so this person feels this way. They're they don't feel quite as earned. And my hope is that there was something that felt um, that felt you know almost that it wasn't complete. That it can't be complete. You know that it's um, that, that there hasn't been enough time that's passed, but it's just. It's the it's the glimmer of of hope that it will be, you know. Mm. I think I think what you're saying too is gonna it kind of falls into a question we were gonna ask, and and I think this was the right decision because the original name of the film was Soldier's Heart. Uh, but like right. you said, if it's if it's about the journey, then you know Soldier Revenge is definitely more fitting, and it definitely caters to the character of Frank way more than what the original title would have been. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And, and, and um, the decision making of of change of the name changing. Uh, yeah, I, I think you so you know where Soldier's Heart came from, right? Originally, no. So Soldier's Heart was Mike really wanted to make this a film about PTSD and uh, and about that kind of the psychological wounds that we carry from war and right. how that might. Um, 
how that might make us feel like our worst selves and how we want to hide those selves from the people that we love, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so soldier's heart was actually the way that they would describe PTSD after the second world war. They didn't, you know, they didn't, modern psychology didn't exist and they couldn't necessarily diagnose what was happening with these people, but they had the same symptoms that we identify as PTSD today. Um, so that was the condition as it was known It's just kind of, it, it, it appeared that these people had lost heart. They had, were, they were affected in some way that we didn't really get. And, um, uh, so I, I think, uh, yeah, so th that's why it was originally called Soldier's Heart. Uh, I don't know quite the uh, decision-making and why it became revenge. Maybe, uh, maybe there was another movie with that name, or maybe they just thought that, uh, I don't know, Soldier's Revenge looked spicy, or maybe, maybe they just thought I was too angry towards the kids. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, and, and I would, you know, we we were we were both thinking like you know the element PTSD was you know as soon as you start the film is 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 there, um, and I was curious because I, I mean even in 2020 people aren't really having these conversations, um, people aren't really knowing how to diagnose it in the way it needs to be in the treatment that needs to be done. So I was thinking if you're going to go on that element in the Western, how do you address that to make it authentic? Considering now way beyond that, you know it's still something that's really you know, wishy-washy. People aren't really being able to have the conversation to understand it. So I, 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 if I'm understanding correctly, that's why it was mentioned and, and we know it was there, but it was never fully yeah. addressed throughout the movie because it couldn't have been addressed because it wasn't nothing that you can ever say like, this is something, you know? Yeah, 100%. I, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, it's not like I could ride up to Dodge City and say, uh, I'm here to see Mr. Sigmund Freud. You know, like <laughs> yeah. that, that service didn't exist. It was like, well, we don't have Mr. Freud. We have whores or we have whiskey, sir. Um, or we have shooting people in the street. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think uh, people are of their time. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of history. Um, and uh, it's, it's interesting to me that the more we know about PTSD, comes at a time when we're really removed, you know, at least mechanically from the real true horrors of what used to be ancient war. I mean, think about the way that Romans or Greeks used to fight. They would fight from sun up to sundown in, you know, in, in close proximity, essentially just stabbing people in abject fear for, for, you know, 12 hours and trying desperately to survive. That to me, is really, really terrifying. I mean, just on a, on a personal level, and that would probably haunt me for the rest of my days, not to minimize what soldiers go through today, but just for contrast sake, today we have drone pilots that might never go to the country that they're, that they're serving in a combat zone yeah. um, that also have those same, those same effects. And so it's just interesting to me that like, the further we become divorced from the act of war, uh, we're also kind of more uh, acutely aware of its effects upon the human body. And so I think to, to bring it back to the Civil War and Frank, it, it's, you know, we have, we didn't have the the language or the understanding of the sensitivity to deal with what was happening. Yep. And for that matter, neither did he. So I want to go back to an earlier point you made. I think we, we just have time for a couple more questions. But uh, yeah, you, mentioned, sure. you mentioned earlier about how, you know, it's tough to uh, do a Western and not, or I guess any movie really, and not fall into kind of the, uh, you know, cliche or, you know, in other words, you know, the um, iconic roles that you've seen in that genre. Um, but in this movie, you had someone that has one of those kind of iconic roles. You had Val Kilmer. So, you know. Who? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, 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 this method actor no. who made like one movie. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I think I saw him at crap service one day. Nice fella. <laughs> nice fella. Great smile. I hope he sticks with it. <laughs> did, uh, so what was it like working with him? And did he give you some advice, any advice? Or, or did, you, did he just kind of let you kind of be your own character and him be he, his? He, he just kept hitting on me the whole time. I mean, I'm so handsome. <laughs> I, I would be flattered uh, if that happened to me. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, you know, Val's, Val's, Val's great. He's, um, he's, he's such a... Uh, I... I <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I should just, I should just 
I should just come out with this as, as my disclaimer. I'm really weird around celebrities. I don't know why, uh, but I'm not weird. Like I'm kind of not Chris Farley weird. <laughs> like, I'm not that, <laughs> that kind of weird, but I'm also not cool. And like, for whatever reason, I like, I'm like, all right, well, I'm just going to treat this person like a human being. So Michael's first shot between Val and I is us sitting around this like coffee table with each other. And we're having, <laughs> we're having coffee and it was so weird because Val's got his whole entourage with him. He's like, you know, Michael's so excited. He keeps taking pic, like sneaky selfies of himself because Val in the background, like just, <laughs> just excited. And I'm like, this, is, this thing is so weird. And I'm trying to get to know the guy because he's my long last dad. And I'm like, all right, well, I've got to establish some relationship. So he's like, so it's Val, right? Oh, cool, cool. Uh, so what have you been, uh, what have you been working on? I just, and he's like, I just shot a movie. And like, oh, which one? It's like, Top Gun 2. Oh, cool. What's that about? <laughs> 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 you got a, got a big part in that? Or like, and I'm just like, part of me wants to, and it's dumb. I should just be like, I hear my favorite person ever. And then like, I've, I've modeled uh, my professional, personal, and romantic lives on, on every character in play. I should just say that because that's the truth. But instead, I kind of clam up and, um, um, I and, and get weird, but uh, he's he was so you, you know the thing I was most most impressed about with him is he was so present. Um, and I you know I wasn't. He made me feel very relaxed in our scenes. Um, he he was so easy. Uh, you know he didn't belabor what he was doing, and um, and we shot some pretty easy stuff. Uh, which was kind of our first chunk. And then later, you know, I, I got comfortable enough with them that I felt like there needed to be one of those kind of rewrites that uh, just to kind of, because some stuff kind of didn't make sense. And I was, uh, I wanted to come in and just ask him about it. So I come in and I knock on his door and I'm sitting there and we're kind of reading through the stuff, um, through the, reading through the stuff. And this is one of my favorite moments that I saw of him. He, he still loves to fuck with people and really like tease them. And, uh, and, and you know that Val's had some, some health trouble as well. So people don't necessarily always know what Val they're getting. And that, that was also kind of part of it as well. It was like because he's, he's had cancer and he's recovered. And, um, mm -hmm. So um, there's still that mystique. And so this costume, uh, we're reading through the scene. And, and this costume girl comes in with his costume as like a different alternative. And the costume designer wants to see it on him. She knocks it and she's so nervous. And she's like, I'm back, Mr. Kilmer Val, Val, Val. Hey, um, hi, hi. Um, would you mind trying this on? It's just we wanted to see. And he turns around with this like dead eyed zombie drunken stare at her. And she gets so freaked out that she just puts it on the, on the, on the railing of the trailer and like scurries away. And he busts into the biggest grin I've ever seen <laughs> for everybody in the trailer. And it's, it was just beautiful. I was like, oh, there's, he's, yeah, man, there, there is that guy. I know that smile. I love that smile. So yeah. we, um, we talked a lot about that scene, and uh, that was a scene that was kind of us, just that solo scene up on the ridge uh, with one another. And um, it was one of my favorite moments. You know, I, I walked through it. I was like, hey, man, does this make sense to you? And he's like, no, not really. I was like, okay, well, this is what I think is, is important in the scene. This is what I want to get from this, and this is what I think this is kind of, what this moment is between us. What do you think? And so I was thinking about cutting this and, and it occurred to me that like, I wasn't trying to, I wasn't trying to direct him. I wasn't trying to rewrite the scene. I'm just working on a, a problem. You know, two colleagues were working on a problem uh, that uh, of, of something in the script that needed to be fixed and found a solution. And that moment on the Ridge, I was just like, man, I, I don't know really where we're going, but, I just trust this person so much. And it was some of the most simple, straightforward acting moments I've ever had in my life. Just, and we got in a magic hour. It was, it was beautiful. Really, really beautiful. Mm. That's awesome. That's a great yeah, story. It yeah, it is. <laughs> Sounds like an old Western. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Looking so, into his smile, riding off in the sun. <laughs> yeah, man. I know. I know. Yeah, it was, it, it was, it was great, you guys. I mean, look, I, I, if I can leave you with any piece of advice, it's just uh, if they ask you if you know how to ride a horse, do yourself a favor and lie. <laughs> yeah. it's, 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 
Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Neil, for for your time. It's my pleasure, busy. Guys. Yeah. You know, the, the movie just came out. It came out on Friday, Thursday, I believe. No, it's, uh, it's no, coming, coming out, out tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, yeah. out tomorrow. Yeah, oh, yeah, it'll be out tomorrow. Yeah, June tomorrow. just in time for Father's Day. Exactly. Yeah, um, yeah, and, yeah, and I got to go buy another bottle of liquor and yell at some kids. So I'll get out of your hair. <laughs> so you're really method acting again. <laughs> oh no, no, that's just my real life. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a terrible human being, guys. In real life, you know, I play heroes on film. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pleasure to talk with you guys. Take Thanks it you. easy. Take Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. And again, you can get Soldier's Revenge. It is available on Blu-ray and digital platforms tomorrow, June 16th. Definitely check it out um, and, um, you know, support them and do this hard time through the pandemic as people are still trying to release a lot of good content out there for people. So um, that was an amazing interview, David. Yep. Yeah, that was a lot of fun. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, as always, go to watcherpass.com for movie reviews, news, information, and recommendations. And uh, we'll catch you the next time.